Hi, and welcome to the video courses for Windows Server 2016. My name is Patrick Lohner, and I'll be your instructor. Let's start with a little bit about my background. I've been in the IT industry for just about 18 years. I got my start with an MCSE on Windows NT, and have sort of worked my way up through the ranks on every version of Windows that has existed. Uh, I began my career in a position of network administration at a training center where I handled just about everything, uh, imaging of PCs, hardware and software troubleshooting in classroom environments, as well as uh, for the business side of things. Touched just about everything and sort of felt like a jack of all trades, master of none. I quickly got into training some of the Windows 2000 courses and CompTIA courses and, as they say, the rest is history and I've been working as a Microsoft certified trainer now for uh, the better part of 18 years. Uh, I've had a couple positions, one with the training center, another with a network consulting firm for three years where we were involved heavily in projects uh, for upgrading to newer versions of Windows Server, upgrading and migrating to Exchange. For the past 10 years, I've operated as a freelance trainer and network consultant. It's my pleasure to be your instructor on these courses, and let's get ready to get into the material. In this first topic, we're going to just go through an introduction to Windows Server 2016, along with talking about the various installation options, additions, and uh, licensing. Licensing, As I said, knowing the capabilities of the operating system is going to enable you to utilize it effectively and take full advantage of what it can offer for your organization. Some of the changes in Windows Server 2016 include increased scalability and performance, improved virtualization, uh, improved management tools, additional deployment options like the nano server option. And so we're going to be discussing those different features and capabilities, in particular those that relate to the computer and storage space, uh, along with various installation options that are available. So let's start in this first section with just installing Windows Server 2016. And you can see uh, we'll go through an introduction to Windows. Uh, planning for installation. We'll go through the procedure for installing Nano Server and Server Core. If you're not familiar with Nano Server, don't worry. We're going to go uh, into that as well. And then finally, adding roles and features. So we begin with the introduction. Okay, Knowing the capabilities of this system is going to help you in the installation. It's going to help you with the configuration of the OS choosing the right edition, uh, choosing the roles and features. Of course, roles, if you're familiar with previous versions, just relate to the job that the server is doing within your environment, the, the particular functionality that it provides. And then features assist us uh, by adding capabilities uh, to individual roles that are already installed. Windows Server 2016 uh, has been awaited for uh, quite some time. All right, It was the release of this version of the server was delayed several times. So it's a long-awaited upgrade to Windows Server 2012 R2, and it does provide enhancements uh, in a number of different areas. Okay, those areas would be the, the versions. We have some additional versions that are available. Hyper-V has uh, quite a number of advancements, specifically in the area of containers, which is an isolation mechanism to allow us to be more efficient in the handling of hardware resources when we're utilizing hardware virtualization. Storage support, there are new uh, protocols like data center bridging, uh, ISNS, along with increased enhanced support for storage area networks like Fiber Channel and iSCSI. In addition to that, we've got the uh, enhancement to the storage spaces feature that was introduced in Windows Server 2012 that provides us with a lot of flexibility and scalability even when dealing with direct attached storage. There are going to be some changes to failover clustering as well that's going to help us to implement high availability and PowerShell configurations. PowerShell version 5 is the version that ships with Windows Server 2016 and Windows 10. Cosmetically, it has been enhanced in that the standard PowerShell window now offers uh, color coding and IntelliSense, PowerShell ISE as well, builds upon those capabilities. But in addition to just the cosmetics, uh, it 
is going to change because we now can access virtually every aspect of the operating system via Windows PowerShell. So we can manage it through the GUI or we can manage it in the command line. In some cases, this is going to be an, a preference. In other cases, it's just simply going to be more efficient to utilize Windows PowerShell, especially if we need to auto automate repetitive tasks or if we need to manage remote computers or even manage multiple objects uh, all at the, the same time. So as we step through uh, the different role features in Windows Server 2016, they're gonna fit into these categories, and then of course we're gonna spend the rest of the course kind of hammering out all the details of this uh, updated version of Server. So the first choice that you have is gonna be the choice of addition. What Windows Server addition should you choose to install? And of course there are several editions of Windows Server. Uh, and it's dependent on your particular organization. It's dependent on the particular server itself and the job that it's going to have to do. We want to make sure that we're choosing the right edition in regards to the needs of a particular uh, scenario. And the reason is because the licensing costs are different for these various versions. And so we can, you know, we can save a lot of money if we choose the right version. So let's start with the Windows Server 2016 Essentials Edition. Uh, this one is designed for small businesses. It technically corresponds to the Windows Small Business Server from earlier versions. It has some limits. It only allows up to 25 users and 50 devices to be joined to the domain. And it only supports two processor cores. However, it does support up to 64 gigabytes of memory, which should suffice in any small business uh, scenario. It does not support a lot of the features of Windows Server 2016. However, they're going to be the more advanced features, right? One of those, and possibly the most important one, would be the virtualization. So Hyper-V is not a supported role on Windows Server 2016 Essentials. Uh, one other note about Essentials is that while this might be the right choice for certain small businesses, you're unlikely to see any questions in regards to Essentials. Okay, uh, I've taken many a Microsoft test and I've never gotten a question on small business server, nor have I ever seen a question on the essentials version, which is what SBS was called in 2012 and 2016. So typically what we're going to be dealing with a standard and data center. Windows Server 2016 standard edition uh, is primarily designed for physical server deployments. So it does support virtualization, but if your goal is to set up a virtualization host, then standard is probably not the right choice. Uh, and the primary reason for that is it only includes licenses for two virtual machines. So that, that's not going to suffice for a majority of production environments. Uh, this edition does support up to 64 sockets for CPUs. It does support up to 4 terabytes of RAM. Uh, and it provides the vast majority of roles and features that are available for Server 2016. You can also install Windows Server 2016 standard uh, in the Nano Server installation. Windows Server 2016 Data Center Edition is the one that's designed for highly virtualized infrastructures. If you're operating in a private or hybrid cloud environment, you should install this. It provides all the roles and features that are available for the OS. Up to 64 processor sockets, but up to 640 processor cores, still limited to 4 terabytes of RAM. The real key and the reason that it's used in virtualization scenarios is that it, is, it supports an unlimited number of virtual machine licenses. Okay. It also includes several new features that standard does not, such as storage spaces direct, storage replica, uh, shielded virtual machines, you know, and other features for software-defined uh, data center scenarios. Microsoft Hyper-V Server 2016, this acts as a standalone virtualization server. It includes all the new features that, uh, you know, regard or relate to virtualization. Okay. The host operating system, the real key here is the host OS is available to you or to organizations at no cost. So the base operating system for the host doesn't cost anything, and then you just have to pay for the individual licenses for virtual machines. 64 sockets, 4 terabytes of RAM. Uh, it does support domain joining, but it does not support other roles. Okay? It has a very limited set of file service features, and it is a 
uh, command line only version of the OS. So it does not have a GUI. It has a different user interface. It has a menu of configuration task. It would primarily be managed remotely via Windows PowerShell. Uh, Windows Storage Server comes in two forms, Workgroup Edition and Standard Edition. Uh, Workgroup Edition is an entry-level unified storage appliance, so it allows up to 50 users, one processor core, 32 gigs of RAM, and can be joined to the domain. The Standard Edition is you know, back up to 64 sockets, uh, 4 terabytes of RAM, two virtual machine licenses, and does support some roles like DNS, DHCP, but will not support others. Both of those are designed to be a storage server, a file server using SMB, uh, probably uh, setting up in a scale out file server cluster. And as we'll see later in the course, that's gonna often be the, the target for iSCSI initiators. Uh, that is going to be the storage location for virtual hard drive files on Hyper-V virtualization host. So you do have multiple editions. The vast majority of cases, we're probably just choosing between standard and data center, but it is important to understand these other editions that exist and the capabilities that they provide, along with the scenarios in which they might be implemented. Now, the hardware requirements that are needed to support Windows Server 2016 are gonna vary based on the services that the system is providing. What's the load on the server? How responsive do you need it to be? Um, the, you know, each, basically each role and feature is gonna put a unique load on the four major subsystems of network, processor, disk, and memory. And so while it's important to know what the minimums are, it's not the only thing to think about. In fact, we very rarely, if ever, are going to be installing a server that uses the minimum hardware requirements. So we need to cover these, but in reality, you're going to have to do some planning to figure out exactly what this system is going to do, and that's going to help you identify the amount of memory in it. So for instance, if you have a machine that's running as a domain control or DNS DHCP, well, those are those are very critical services in the environment, but they're not very resource intensive. So you could probably get away with two gigs of RAM, four gigs of RAM, a minimal amount of hard drive space. If you're gonna set up a SQL server or an exchange server, well then immediately I'm gonna need a whole lot more hard drive space, and I'm probably going to want an, uh, much, you know, uh, a lot more memory. Okay. So eight gigs is about the minimum on a exchange server, probably more like 16 or 32 gigs of RAM. So that's what I mean. You just kind of have to think about those things. Uh, server core installation is the default installation now. That is an installation that does not include a GUI. It's a smaller footprint of the operating system, so it requires a little less uh, hardware by default. 64-bit CPU at 1.4 gigahertz, at least 512 megs of RAM, and at least 32 gigabytes of hard drive space. But like I said, we have to think about what that server is going to be doing in the environment to ensure that we give it an adequate number of resources. Let's talk about some additional considerations here uh, for the hardware. You know, virtualized deployments are going to require the same minimum requirements for guest operating systems, but the initial memory needs during the installation could be uh, a little higher. Okay, so you can allocate extra memory for the VM for the install, and then you can deallocate that after installation, or you can just utilize dynamic memory. Uh, nano server, the, uh, again, we haven't really talked about it in great detail, but it, in a nutshell, nano server is just a, an even more scaled down version of server core. Uh, so it, it has even fewer hardware requirements they're minimized greatly, as you can see there, uh, using as little as 440 megabytes of hard disk space. That is going to depend on the roles that are installed. So for instance, a, a VHD running nano with IIS and commonly used drivers is just gonna be roughly over, a little over 500 megabytes, okay? So it is much less. The desktop experience on Windows Server 2016, which means the GUI, Server Manager, File Explorer, Internet, or Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, that's gonna require approximately four gigs of hard drive space um, more than the, than the others. 
Uh, some other requirements, storage and network adapters should be PCI Express compliant. Uh, you need for over the network installations, we're going to want high capacity RAM and greater hard drive space. Uh, a TPM chip, the trusted platform module, that's going to be required for certain features such as BitLock or drive encryption. And, uh, and so ideally, if we plan to implement those features, then we should make sure we have a, a TPM chip. So as I said, we don't want to just meet the minimums. We want to think about what the server is doing and ensure that we've got the appropriate hardware for that server. Now, in addition to the the choice of the right addition is the choice of the installation options in Server 2016, and we've alluded to this already. You have three options. Server 2016 Desktop Experience is the full server installation, so that includes a complete graphical management interface, and it supports all the Windows Server roles dependent on the edition that you choose. Uh, the installation option of Server Core, that's the equivalent of Server Core in earlier versions of uh, Windows Server. It provides command line management interface. It does have a reduced hardware footprint, but it doesn't support all of the server roles. You predominantly would be managing this remotely. Uh, Nano Server is the new installation option. There is no equivalent for this in Server 2012 or earlier versions. It's going to be completely administered remotely. Uh, no local management uh, whatsoever, and it's optimized for, for uh, hosting in private cloud and environments and data centers for running applications that are developed by using uh, cloud application patterns. Okay? Uh, it is also unique in that it has to be specially prepared for installation. You can't directly install Nano from the installation media during setup. It's installed as a VHD or as a Windows Imaging or WIM file. And you have to build that file uh, beforehand using Windows PowerShell commands. Okay? And we will go through the, the process for doing that. When you create that file, you can choose to include various packages, and packages in Nano Server are going to be used to install roles and features. So Hyper-V, failover clustering, file server, DNS, uh, IIS, you know, those kinds of roles are supported. Not all roles uh, are supported, but those integral roles and features will be. Now, you have several options for managing Windows Server 2016, uh, and this is pretty consistent for the most part with uh, previous versions. Even the first statement here that interactive management is minimized, there's a heavier emphasis on remote management. In fact, Microsoft goes so far as to say that it's not best practice to do interactive management. Uh, with Server Core, for instance, and to an even greater extent, Nano Server, the local management options are actually very limited. So once we've installed those systems and configured network and firewall settings, then everything else, all management tasks, are going to be done remotely. Uh, the way that we would do that, graphically speaking, is through the remote server administrative tools. The remote server administrative tools that are available for Windows 10 can remotely manage systems running Windows Server 2016. All right, so we would download and install those on a Windows 10 box, and then we would have to go in and use the uh, add Windows features or turn Windows features on and off in Control Panel in order to turn certain elements on. Uh, primarily, the main management tool with RSAT would be Server Manager. And Server Manager in 2016 looks almost identical to what it looked like in 2012. It is going to be the primary graphical tool for managing and monitoring remote systems. And then, of course, we've got the individual MMC consoles that go with a particular role. So if you're trying to manage a domain controller, you'll use the Active Directory Administrative Center or Active Directory Users and Computers. If you're trying to manage a DNS server, you'll use the DNS management console, and so on and, and so forth. Uh, Windows PowerShell remoting, you can configure PowerShell on a local client to make a connection to a remote server, and then run commands or scripts against those systems. Uh, it's you know possible to load various modules locally, such as those for Server Manager, and then run commands contained in those modules against the remote server. Uh, ter server 2016 supports a new option of using PowerShell Direct 
PowerShell Direct is used to run PowerShell scripts or commands on virtual machines from the actual host system. So I can connect, I can either be logged on directly to the host or I can connect remotely to the host. But within the host, I can run PowerShell commands against the guest operating systems that are hosted uh, within its own virtual machine. Then you have Remote Shell WinRS. This is a utility or feature that has been a, around for a while. It's com another command line tool. It's a collection of standards-based technologies that allow us to manage server hardware if we're signed in directly or, or over the network. Uh, server Manager relies on WinRM. Windows PowerShell remoting also relies on WinRM. It's unlikely that we're using Remote Shell directly. We're probably using Windows PowerShell or Server Manager, which is just utilizing it as an underlying technology. Uh, we've also got Remote Desktop. You can connect to a remote machine as if you were logged on locally. Uh, so uh, Remote Desktop is supported on the desktop experience, and it's also supported on Server Core. Remote Desktop is not supported with the Nano Server installation option. And then Group Policy can also be used to manage both Server Core and full installations of Windows Server, just like you can manage any other computer. Uh, it cannot also be used to manage Nano Server, so we'll, we'll talk about that. I mean, primarily Group Policies is used to configure security settings, configure auditing, event log management, uh, and others, but it really, there's no end to what you can do with, uh, with group policy. So those are the management tools. Now PowerShell remoting and server manager remoting is actually enabled by default because WinRM, like it was in 2012, is turned on by default. We just have to realize that some of the MMC consoles are not, or all of the MMC consoles, excuse me, are not going to be using WinRM. So things like event log management from Event Viewer on a remote system, service management, disk management, those are going to require some additional ports. And it's because the MMC actually uses DCOM or the Distributed Component Object Model uh, in order to make that connection. All right, so there are certain firewall ports that have to be opened up to allow DCOM access in. And then we've got things like remote event log management, service management, disk management, and the like that have to be enabled in order for some of the MMC utilities to work remotely. So as we said, Windows PowerShell is a command line administrative interface uh, and full-blown scripting language designed with system administration in mind. Uh, it helps you to perform day-to-day -day tasks. It helps you to automate repetitive tasks. We can write scripts to handle repetitive tasks in a more orderly fashion. We can run the commands against a single machine or multiple remote machines. It is incredibly powerful, no pun intended. Windows PowerShell was originally introduced with Windows Vista and Windows Server 2008. Okay? At that point, and really all the way up till Windows 8 and 2012, it was, it was powerful, but not as powerful as we would like to see. Windows 8 and Server 2012 introduced PowerShell version 3. And in so doing, they added to the number of commands that we have by the thousands. Uh, at this point, virtually everything you can think of could be done via Windows PowerShell. Now, I said before, it might just be a preference. Some people might prefer to use the command line. Somebody has a Unix or Linux background, they might prefer to use the command line. In other cases, it's just flat out more efficient. In, in any case, this is definitely something that you need to know. PowerShell's not going away. Uh, it is uh, enhanced with every single version, and it is emphasized more with every single version. Okay? We see that emphasis here, you know, it's with Nano Server. Nano Server really magnifies the importance of remote management. It gives us a truly headless configuration because Nano Server has no GUI. Uh, it has no local sign-in options. Everything will be done remotely. Okay, now with Server Core, you still did a lot remotely, but you could actually log on locally and make changes. There was an S-Config utility that would allow you to make certain changes outside of PowerShell. With Nano Server, none of that exists. And so it, it just... We see this ongoing emphasis 
and expansion to Windows PowerShell. If you're going to be a Windows system admin, and if you're going to take Microsoft exams, then you are going to have to learn Windows PowerShell. Do you have to learn how to write scripts? Maybe not. But you need to be able to recognize commandlets, the correct syntax, understand the various uh, uh, tools that you have with Windows PowerShell, that's going to be very important. So as we go through this course, we'll spend a lot of time looking at Windows PowerShell because there's going to be a heavy emphasis on it uh, on the exam. So let's talk about just some of the basics of Windows PowerShell. The first is the term commandlet. I mean, commandlet is really a made up term, but it's one that Microsoft made up in order to distinguish PowerShell commands from other executables, okay? So ipconfig, for instance, is not a PowerShell command. Now you can run ipconfig in a PowerShell window just because PowerShell gives you access to the old executables and it'll show you the IP configuration. Or you can run the get net IP configuration commandlet or get net IP address commandlets. So when we say commandlet, we're always talking about PowerShell commands and those PowerShell commands will come in are with a familiar syntax. Now, PowerShell commands are included and installed via modules. So a module is simply a term that refers to a collection of PowerShell commands. And if you wanna have access to certain commands, those modules have to be loaded. Now, a lot of times they are loaded for you by you installing a certain role. So for instance, if I install the Hyper-V role on a machine, it will install the Hyper-V module for Windows PowerShell. Same thing with Active Directory Domain Services. And in neither of those cases do I actually have to run the import module commandlet. It'll just be there. But there are other times where you are going to need to import a particular module in order to make it available. Uh, PowerShell remote management is configured using the enable PS remoting uh, commandlet. Okay, it's just it's just called remoting. As we said, this does depend on the WinRM service running on target systems. So the enable PS remoting is just a way to turn on WinRM. All right. Uh, the easiest way to do remoting is just one-to-one -one, where you run a command and specify a computer name parameter and put in a remote computer, or you uh, create a PowerShell session with a remote computer so that you can execute multiple commands. PowerShell Direct provides simpler management in virtualized environments that are using uh, Hyper-V. As we said before, this is going to allow you to run a PowerShell commander script inside a virtual machine from the host operating system. So that's without regard to any sort of network and firewall configurations. The guest operating system doesn't have to have remote management enabled. So this is very, it's going to be very beneficial uh, it's uh, and it's pretty simple to do. We also have PowerShell desired state configurations uh, or DSC. Now we're going to be going through that in more detail in another chapter, but it provides declarative configurations where group policy can't be used. And so that is very key because you see, especially in cloud environments, we're a lot of times dealing with remote systems that may not be in the same domain as we are. They may not even be members of the domain. Well, when you're not a member of the domain or you're in a different domain than me, then group policy really ceases to be very adequate for remote management. And so the PowerShell desired state configuration is going to allow us to do a lot of the same things that group policy would give us the ability to do, but without regard to any sort of domain membership. Okay. So as I said, there, there will be more on that later, but those are some of the, just the basics of Windows PowerShell at this point. A Windows Server 2016 has a number of new features as well as significant improvements over the earlier versions of the uh, operating system. Uh, some of these new features were first introduced in 2012 or 2012 R2, and others are brand new to 2016. So let's take a look at what's new since 2008. In other words, these were first introduced in 2012, or in some cases 2012 R2, uh, but they've then been improved upon in 2016, okay? Work folders is the first. This is a mechanism for both domain joined as well as non-domain joined systems to connect to the workplace and access and synchronize corporate data files. 
uh, DHCP failover. It allows you to deploy two DHCP servers, and those servers would contain overlapping scopes. If one server goes offline, then the clients can renew their configuration from the failover server. It was just a much easier way of implementing high availability for DHCP, which is a critical service. IP address management was first introduced in 2012 that provides administrative and monitoring capabilities for the whole IP address infrastructure uh, within the organization. You can monitor and audit as well as manage servers that run DHCP and DNS. Dynamic access control was introduced in 2012 as well. It's a claims-based authorization platform that is used to control access to file resources throughout the organization. Uh, this is in addition to file and folder permissions that would already protect the resource. Basically, DAC is allowing you to apply access control permission based on rules uh, that you know, identify the sensitivity of the resource, the job role of the user, uh, the particular device they can access them from. Gives you a lot of the same capabilities as it relates to authorizing access to resources, but doing so without having to come up with complex uh, group structures. Support for domain controller virtualization was uh, another uh, that was introduced in 2012, just the ability to virtualize DCs. Uh, in addition to that, the ability to clone virtualized domain controllers, to rapidly deploy new virtual domain controllers. Data deduplication. Uh, involves finding and removing duplication within data that's stored on a file server. So it essentially works by separating files into smaller variable size pieces, identifying duplicate pieces, and then just maintaining a single copy of each piece. So it allows you to store more data in less space. Authentication silos are another new feature in Server 2012. They didn't get a whole lot of uh, play in the exams. In fact, it's uh, actually the majority would be server 2012 R2 that authentication silos existed. They give us just the ability to contain logins within a domain. Windows PowerShell remote and local management uh, greatly increased in 2012. If you recall, I said that PowerShell 3.0 that came with 2012 really opened the floodgates and allowed us to configure just about anything in the operating system via PowerShell. Storage spaces uh, allow cost-effective, highly available local storage. It gives you a lot of flexibility and scalability that you would normally only have with a storage area network. Now, storage spaces tiering, or storage tiers for short, were introduced in R2, uh, and that's a feature that automatically moves frequently accessed data to faster storage within a pool and then less frequently accessed data would be moved to the slower storage. So it allowed you to mix and match different storage types. So now what's new in Server 2016? Well, a couple of these we've already mentioned. Nano Server, the new installation option with no graphical or command line interface. Uh, it basically no local login or administration. So it has significantly lower hardware requirements and it's ideal as a platform for Hyper-V. Uh, Windows Server containers and Hyper-V containers. These are going to allow us to isolate your apps from an operating system environment. We'll go over it in more detail later, but it essentially improves security and reliability. So they're, they're isolated from one another, but they run on the host operating system. Hyper-V containers are further isolated because they run within a virtual machine. And then Docker is simply a technology for managing those containers. Uh, it's technically a, a Linux-based technology, but Windows Server 2016 is providing support for Docker to manage these containers. Rolling upgrades for Hyper-V and storage clusters. Uh, this will allow you to add Server 2016 failover cluster nodes uh, to an existing 2012 R2 failover cluster. So the cluster will continue to operate in server 2012 R2 functional level while you sort of roll out the new version. And then once you've upgraded out all nodes to 2016, then you can change the functional level. Uh, hot add support in virtual machines. This is for virtual memory as well as network adapters. Those can simply be added or removed while the virtual machines are running. Nested virtualization in Hyper-V uh, will allow you to 
run virtual machines within a virtual machine. That is very beneficial for lab environments, but also could be used in private cloud environments. Shielded virtual machines allow you to protect the data inside a virtual machine from unauthorized access. It's always been a problem where you utilize virtualization because the virtualization ha admins would technically have the ability to get into the virtual machines and access data, and so uh, we needed a way to protect that. PowerShell Direct, we've already mentioned, it just allows you to uh, create commands or scripts and run those against a guest operating system in a virtual machine from the host directly. Uh, storage Spaces Direct is a feature that allows you to build, build highly available storage with directly attached disk on each node in a cluster. And then SMB or Server Message Block version 3 is going to uh, provide resiliency. The Storage Replica allows you to synchronously or asynchronously replicate volumes at the block level. Okay? And, uh, and then there are some additional improvements as well uh, that we'll get into. And, and so really this is not a a completely comprehensive list or a lot of other improvements to existing features and you can find information uh, about that by using TechNet. Come on.